So first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for actually inviting me to what is my first uh, um, AQC conference, uh, which is kind of slightly undeserved advanced praise. Um, I have worked on flux qubits uh, very early in the early 2000s um, and got, you know, kind of distracted by gate-based quantum computing over the last few years, but it's kind of great to uh, look at this. And uh, what I would like to look at is something that's been bugging me for a long time, um, which is the environmental effects and specifically environmental renormalization effects in quantum annealing. And that's work we have done um, with uh, in my group, uh, Tobias Chasseur has done the calculations. Our renormalization studies were kept honest by Stefan Kehrein from Göttingen, and we are very happy to be f uh, funded by the QEO program. And usual disclaimer, we do not represent the official opinion of the US government. So I will motivate you why we are taking a kind of a new look at these environmental effects, specifically motivated by a physical concept that some of you will very well know, the dissipative phase transition, but it's probably not familiar to everybody, so I will uh, walk through this uh, uh, first, and then look at what happens if we take this one qubit concept and apply it to a large quantum annealer, and I will tell you what I mean by uh, what we call the LGDS phase, and um, if I have time, then tell you how next to studying the effect of uh, decoherence on quantum annealing, we can also use this effect to measure in a more, more versatile way than we thought uh, before. So what's the motivation? So here's a few basic questions. One of them was put out by John Martinez before he himself really got interested in quantum annealing, which is, can there be quantum speed up without quantum coherence? By which he meant temporal coherence of a superposition between energy eigenstates. And I mean, we understand that there can be quantum speed up, but um, yeah, that's where we're coming from. And in 2017, from Jamie Kerman, he raised the question, which turns out to be related, what is the role of reorganization energy of an environment that's coupling to our quantum annealer? And um, well, some people uh, in the gate-based community still think that if you do not keep temporal coherence for a long time, you cannot have speed up. So they are skeptical about quantum annealing as all, and I will try to address those questions. How do we want to approach them? So it's very clear that computational power in quantum annealing comes from superpositions of classical computational states, of the states that we read out. We use the driver Hamiltonian to create those superpositions. But we do not really need um, to create superpositions of the temporal energy eigenstates. It's enough to have the superpositions of computational states. So how do we deal with this difference? And we try to answer this by trying to really destroy quantum annealing by coupling to the environment as hard as we can. And we want to rule out classical noise effects, which would include 1 over f noise in this kind, uh, 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 in this context. So we want to see what happens at uh, zero temperature if we try to kill annealing at zero temperature. And specifically, this is a situation where it's hard to conceive to be able to write down a Markovian master equation. So what else can we do? And the physics we are basing this on is on a phenomenon called the dissipative phase transition. Let me take a poll. Who of you knows the dissipative phase transition? Adrian knows that. OK, so okay, a very small group in the, uh, in the room knows about the uh, dissipative phase transition. And it's related to how you go along the quantum to classical boundary um, even in the space of eigenstates, it was pioneered um, by first Albert Schmidt and then sp more specifically by Caldera and Leggett. And uh, they originally looked at this for the physics of a single Josephson junction where they showed, is there a laser pointer? Um, where they showed that um, 
If you have a single Josephson junction, you have a Josephson phase, and if that has a fixed value, the Josephson fun uh, junction superconducts, whereas if it's randomly spread out, the Josephson junction cannot conduct because it has a big mixture of phases, and it's an insulator, and people were able to show that there is a sharp superconductor to insulator phase transition as a function of the strength of the coupling to the environment, which is in uh, the case of the plot from a 20-year-old paper, um, a ratio of the quantum resistance versus the shunt resistance in the Josephson junction. Now, more appropriate for us, this has been introduced also for the physics of two-state systems, and there is this remarkable curiosity that the first flux qubit was invented before Feynman ever talked about quantum computing by Tony Leggett as a way to test the quantum classical boundary in a macroscopic system. This is uh, kind of the historic paper. And how you study this transition there, that was done by Adrian's group in the most clear way you can think of, is they showed that as a function of a tunable coupling between system and environment, they were able to completely kill the tunnel splitting. So the delta is the tunnel splitting. Delta zero is what you would have if there was no environment. Um, and that also has a flux dependence, as you see. But the purple points. Um, uh, show you that there is an additional tuning of the measured energy splitting, which comes from the fact that the environment totally kills tunneling. So, um, yes. So how do you study this? Well, the um, standard model for this is the omic spin boson model, which I first write down, this is all background, for a single qubit. So here is a single qubit coupling to a harmonic oscillator bath with a spectral density um, that's shown on the right that is proportional to frequency and has a cutoff. And you choose this uh, spectral density because this reproduces classical friction. Now, if I look at the um, frequency dependence of J um, and of parallel to this of S, which is the noise at finite temperature, this is a straight line, and at the scale omega C, it's being cut off. And um, usually, when we work out rates, we are interested in the spectral density, first of all, at delta, at the tunnel splitting of the qubit. Th um, the spectrum at that frequency describes us uh, relaxation and heating. And we look at this at very low frequency, at like one over the duration of the experiment. And that describes us dephasing. But what about the whole rest of the spectrum? Is this now irrelevant? No, it's not. Uh, you can essentially compute perturbative energy shifts from the rest of the spectrum. And that gets you level repulsion from simple second order perturbation theory. So all the levels that are all the part of the environment that's not at delta or at uh, very low frequencies will essentially shift the frequency of the qubit that you observe. Now, to deal with this, and to deal with the potential to have strong energy shifts, and you may ask yourself who would ever build a quantum computer with strong energy shifts, but bear with me, I will essentially show you that you can easily and accidentally run into this regime. Uh, what we have to do is we again go to our spin boson Hamiltonian, and now I should have written sigma x in the first term of the Hamiltonian. That was, should not commute. Sorry about that. Um, now we essentially treat uh, the coupling as a non-perturbative part and treat the qubit as a perturbation because we are mostly also interested at these high frequencies. So this is a broken axis, so most of the environment is sitting at frequencies above the qubit. Um, if you diagonalize the blue part, what you see is that in each mode of the environment, essentially the uh, eigenstates correspond to this harmonic oscillator shift to the left or to the right. So uh, your eigenstates or per mode are displaced vacua. They are coherent states shifted to the left and the right, which are often also called Schrodinger's cat states. So if you want, you have one cat per mode. And then to bring back the qubit um, as a smaller term, you essentially have to project um, the uh, qubit Hamiltonian onto the space spanned by those modes. So what does this do if we not do it with one mode but with many modes? Well. This is our spectrum again. And the modes at high frequency um, and the formation of the Schrodinger cat states gives you an energy shift. And it shifts the tunnel coupling down because the majority of the modes is sitting at high frequency. And uh, 
recall this is a uh, pic this is a high frequency picture so what now happens is that you have a slightly lower tunnel splitting and the part of the spectrum between delta 0 and delta 1 now also gets your level repulsion so you have to calculate a new correction that is coming from these extra modes delta 2 and so on until the procedure stops and this is what is called a running coupling constant in uh, field theory and if you work this out, essentially it tells you that when you couple your qubit to your environment, the tunnel splitting that you measure is the solution of this equation, which has the effective tunnel, tunnel splitting, so delta effective and delta fix here are synonymous, on the left and on the right. So whatever defines uh, a fast mode depends on the shift you get. So this is a recursive process. And the result of this recursive process is the phase diagram that Adrian's group has measured. Uh, it shows you that at a uh, legged alpha, which is the slope of the um, environment, um, you get a phase transition at alpha equals one. Below this, the system tunnels. On the right, the system environment coupling is so strong that uh, the tunnel splitting in the ground state is um, absent. It has been completely uh, suppressed. So there's a localized and classical phase. So this is all known and essentially physics from the late 80s. I should also mention that the very simple picture with cat states that I've shown to you is a good way to visualize a calculation that's really being done with the perturbative renormalization group, um, also called poor man's scaling in totally antiquated vocabulary. Um, and uh, some of the calculations we've done uh, that I'm going to show you, we've also done with a flow equation renormalization method. So, this was the dissipative phase transition for one qubit. It happens at uh, critical damping, at strong damping. So why do we care? What happens for multiple qubits? So let's first do two. So we take two qubits, two flux qubits. They should be arbitrarily coupled. We, it could be stochastic, it could be non-stochastic. And we get each of them an individual heat path. So there is some dissipation mechanism that is specific uh, to the qubit. And we again work out the same phase diagram as before. Now it's not a straight line, it's a two-dimensional diagram with the damping strength of qubit one and qubit two. It again has a phase where the tunneling is intact, that's the blue triangle. It has a phase where it's totally classical, where both alphas are larger than one. That is the um, pinkish uh, square. And uh, it has uh, phases where only one qubit tunnels. And most uh, interestingly, it has this striped phase where the off-diagonal interactions between the qubits disappear. So the qubits are locally still tunneling, but the interaction between the qubits is already killed by dissipation. And that happens at around alpha equals one half if both alphas are the same. So this is two qubits, and we see that the meaning of uh, killing tunneling the point where this happens goes from alpha equals one to alpha equals one half. And so now we need to go from two to many because ultimately we're interested in a big annealer. So recall we have calculated the dressing of the single qubit and the renormalization by this projection of the qubit Hamiltonian onto the effective eigenstates of the bath. And uh, we introduce a quantity called the renormalization ratio, which is the fixed point delta over the cutoff of the bath to the alpha. And this is a quantity that essentially tells you what is the overlap between uh, the dressing clouds, and it's smaller than one. And if you work out any matrix element of, say, the Hamiltonian between these um, uh, binary eigenstates, it's essentially the original matrix element rescaled by C, by my dressing ratio, times the sum. I'm basically counting the off-diagonal elements. So what this factor C is doing, it accounts for the fact that the qubit states are now dressed by the environment, by the fast parts of the environment. And whenever I have an off-diagonal um, element, I have to take into account the overlap, which is smaller than one. If uh, they are equal, I do not have to do this, and I have to count the off-diagonal elements. So what does that mean? How does this two-qubit phase diagram change if I go to many qubits? Well, let's suppose I have a K local Hamiltonian. And we've heard today how to make uh, three and uh, four local interactions. And if I work out what happens then, is that essentially the, the line where um, things go wrong moves down to one over k. So from one half to one fourth. 
if I am below that, if my qubits are good enough to have a damping strength of less than one fourth, which uh, you know, otherwise you would probably never talk about the qubit, then there is simply a weak rescaling of the energy scales and the problem, which means that your effective delta is slightly smaller than before, but it's a small perturbative correction that simply slightly slows down uh, your quantum annealing. So that would mean that uh, the whole physics I've been talking to you has relatively little consequences. But let's think about this once more. Here we talked about how does the Hamiltonian, the problem Hamiltonian change. And um, because the couplers have small weight, the weight is certainly much smaller than the size of the annealer. That's not the whole story. And we know in spin physics that short range interactions can create long range order or in quantum annealers, k-local interactions can create uh, entanglement that can in principle be huge, uh, if uh, that can in principle be as large as the quantum annealer. So what we have to do, we do not only have to study the um, renormalization of the Hamiltonian, but also the renormalization of the effective ground state. Is the ground state still what we think it is, or does it become more classical? And again, the ground state matrix elements essentially get renormalized by this factor C, which is smaller than one, um, to the power of however many off-diagonal elements I have. And that gets you the reduced density matrix, and that's the density matrix that describes us measurements that are um, um, only occurring on the system, only occurring on the annealer. So that leads us to realizing that on the axis of damping strength, where on the right is crazy overdamped, is alpha equals one, then there's one over k, one which is one half or one fourth. There's a second important point, which is one over n, where n is the size of the annealer. And if your annealer has a thousand qubits, then this uh, in most cases will mean that your experiment, unless you're super duper coherent, is actually between one over n and one over k. Now, if you, are, if you are so coherent that you're below 1 over n, then the ground state hardly has any corrections. This is where thermodynamics lives. Everything is fine there. If you are above 1 over k, there is the situation where some couplings start to effectively disappear. If you're above 1, you're classical. But what I would like to focus on is what we call the LCGD phase. That is not the London College of Garden Design. That's actually a real thing. That's the locally coherent but globally defaced regime, uh, which means that you have enough coherence to, um, uh, that your eigenstate respects all the short range order, but you, you cannot have long range entanglement anymore. And the transition at 1 over L is not a sharp phase transition. It's kind of blurry. So the entanglement does not go completely away. There's an exponential function. And uh, rest assured, things like what you learn in statistical mechanics, namely that uh, systems always thermalize in eigenstates, they are all safe because those are all being derived on the left when you have really weak damping. Remember here, we have one bath per qubit. So um, the... Um, uh, so we're doing something that in thermodynamics you're not supposed to do, but something that likely happens in experiments if all your qubits have a bit of a damping mechanism inside. So um, as mentioned, um, if we say have a thousand qubits, uh, which is something we're aiming for, and which D-Wave obviously has, and k equals two or four, we are quite likely in this LCGD regime. So that means um, if we want to compute the ground state that we would measure, in the influence of this heat bath with, uh, relative to the ideal ground state that we would expect, what we have to do is we have to apply a dephasing channel whose weight is measured by C, by this uh, renormalization ratio. And um, this is how you dephase a single qubit. And what you have to do is you have to apply this channel to all the qubits. So this is a channel, this is a dephasing mechanism that actually provides an entanglement measure that is specifically harmful to Greenberg or horn zeilinger states. Um, and, but this is kind of an easy way to study the effect of uh, this mechanism on uh, the quantum annealing calculation that you would like to do. So what, uh, why should we care about this? Again, if we have adiabatic quantum computing, if we are 
you know, at uh, a very low temperature. We mostly care about the genetics, uh, about the energetics. Sorry, it's late. Um, we mostly care about the energetics, and that is only weakly renormalized. Um, so there is some effect on the gap scaling and on initial state, but it's probably not so harmful. If we have quantum annealing, where we go to an excited state because we are at elevated temperature and then we want to uh, relax down by tunneling through barriers, there may be a larger effect because now you have uh, slightly uh, different states. But specifically in methods where you need to measure during the anneal, where you need to measure where your Hamiltonian has non-commuting elements. Uh, for example, if you want to use a quantum annealer uh, to um, replace um, uh, uh, quantum Monte Carlo for a non-stochastic setting, then in this LCGD phase, potentially your eigenstate is quite wrong and you have to go outside the phase and really have very, very coherent qubits. Now, um, we have run a few example instances. This is for two local couplers and six qubits. And we could show that the purity um, of the state uh, with this Hamiltonian, um, as well as the um, entropy of the effective ground state, which is now not pure anymore, um, have kind of a, um, are drastically impacted by uh, increasing alpha. And we have also compared ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic couplings. And you can show if you compare the colors here are uh, not so uh, well reproduced. But essentially, um, the uh, line, which is quite coherent, the purity of um, uh, the top line is for a stochastic Hamiltonian. The blue line is for a non-stochastic Hamiltonian. So also here we see that for a non-stochastic Hamiltonian, this ground state randomization effect is much stronger than for a stochastic Hamiltonian, giving you a, a hint under which instances this may be most effective. But uh, to be really honest, we do not quite understand the impact of this on quantum annealing. And the reason why I've chosen to give this talk is that I would hopefully learn from you about cases where sampling the eigenstate correctly uh, in the middle of the anneal is most important and what the significance of this is. Because we are pretty confident about the statistical mechanics and the field theory we have done, but the consequences I would like to discuss more. Um, there is related work. Um, there is work on the ground state deformation um, by um, those authors, including Dima Varian and Mohammad Amin. Um, and what we have done is we have extended this to the non-perturbative regime. And in the regimes where they should agree, these works do agree. And uh, there is this nice work by Tamim and Daniel. Uh, which has this nice uh, statement about the uh, ground state. And what our work does, it is clarifying under which conditions you are really in the weak coupling limit. And that can be one, the damping has to be below 1 over n, where n is the number of qubits in your annealer. And it also clarifies that then what you have is a different energy eigenstate because you have this, um, this uh, ground state randomization. Now, last slide. Um, what's with the quantum advantage? Well, in gate-based quantum computing, the errors um, that I have if I don't do error correction uh, scale as one over the number of gates, because I have an error per gate. But also, they go up if I really create large entangled state, large GHZ states. Whereas um, in quantum annealing, instead of the number of gates, I have the weight of the coupling. So that is, in fact, much more benign scaling of environmental impact than in gate-based quantum computing. But um, it's still similar. So there's no free lunch, uh, which I would tell to my gate-based friends. But there is a discount in the sense that this curve that scales with 1 over the maximum weight of a greenberg horn seidinger state at least starts at a much uh, more benign value. This is the attempted conclusion. And if you go to Mario Schöndorf's poster tomorrow, you can see how the same randomization effect can also help you to make a bit more powerful measurements. I think I've used up all my time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks. We have time for one or two questions. So here you are considering um, uh, omic baths. Uh, yes. So what, what are the prospects of looking at other types of environments? 
um, that can be the same randomization technique can be used for other um, environments, specifically also for subomic. All right. Thank you. Anyone else?